Hey guys, today we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, remember, is in this section of chapter 7 through 10, who are which is answering specific questions that the Corinthians had of Paul. And so Paul is writing back. So here in chapter 8, we get one that kind of coincides with Romans 14 and 15, if you can remember that. I'm um, reading it just a, a couple weeks ago about the weaker brother issue. And what is happening here in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians is what is good to eat um, or even drink, okay? Um, and so what happens in this idea of the weaker brother kind of issue is really is the question is if Scripture does not command it, commend it, or forbid it, right? When scripture doesn't say you can or cannot or you should do or should not do certain things, we really get two extremes. Even in today's church, we get two kind of main outcomes. One is legalism and the other one is license. Legalism basically says then if God doesn't say it, then um, say it's good, then it's bad. So everything is bad, even though the Bible doesn't necessarily say it is bad. The other is license saying that if the Bible doesn't say it's bad, then everything is good, right? So it's kind of all one or all of the other. And in church history, and even maybe even churches you've been in um, or have friends are in, churches kind of lend on this on lots of different things. And even over um, times in eras of time. So I I can think about churches, about drinking alcohol, about smoking, about playing cards, about wearing makeup, about what kind of clothes you should wear, about dancing, about sports on Sunday, about styles of music or movies or anything along this manner where the Bible doesn't specifically address something, you will have the two extremes. And so here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it's to deal with food that is being offered to idols. Remember, Corinth was a wicked place. Um, There were many idols. There would have been Acropolis of just a shrine, a place where many idols would have been there. And it was just common for people um, to sacrifice their meat to idols. Um, And basically when somebody would sacrifice their meat to an idol, they would take a meat, they would take it to the priest. Um, A third of that would be burnt up on the altar to the idol. So it would literally be vaporized, would be smoke charred up. So the smoke would rise into the heavens to that God. A third of it would be given to the temple and to the priest. That was their kind of their tithe, their way to keep um, the temple, the church is going. And a third of it, after it was blessed, um, they would take it home and they would eat it because then it was clean. And so here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we have a lot of people and even um, a, a lot of new believers, a lot of converts, people who believe that Jesus was God, but they still haven't came to the spiritual conclusion and the spiritual maturity to say that there was only one God. Many people coming out of a polytheistic kind of culture, they believe that Yahweh, God, was one and Jesus was his son and he was the one, but he was the one over many other gods. He was the one true God and there was a bunch of other weird gods. So in this idea, you have mature believers who understand that there was only one God and all these idols are just fake made up. Second, you have the weaker or the immature or the new converts um, that is believed that there was many gods. So the mature believers who knew that the idols were fake, they would eat the meat of other pay, of other idols. They didn't care. If they went to Texas Roadhouse, they didn't care what idol was getting to because to them, they know um, through the Peter, uh, the vision that Peter got through God saying that all meat is clean. It's all good. You can eat anything. 
um, they would eat, right? But now these weaker or immature brothers would see Christians eating this meat that was burnt to idols and, and they were having problems with them. They're saying, how could you eat meat that was that was on the altar of Zeus or Nike or Pegasus or any other of these gods. How could you do that if you're professing Jesus or God as one, right? And they, they couldn't rationale with this. And so the mature brothers are saying, we can eat anything because there's no such thing. The more immature or the young believers, they couldn't rationalize this. So when they saw the mature believers eating this meat, it was causing the younger Christians to go against their belief, to go against their conscience, and therefore, as we know in Romans 14 and 15, and even explained here in 1 Corinthians 8, that when they go against their conscience, it's a sin. They're causing them to sin. Not necessarily that they meant to, they have the freedom to do so, but our freedom is not just freedom to do whatever we want, our freedom is to edify the body of Christ. That means to the lowest believer, to the most spiritual mature believer. So as believers, we have a license, but that license has some restraints on it. And so Paul is writing in chapter eight of teaching these Christians on how they should um, keep within these restraints. And so with that knowledge, just it's all, this is a short chapter, right? Concerning food offered to these idols, all of us possess the knowledge. He's talking to the mature Christians, right? We possess the knowledge that knows that this meat is okay to eat, right? But this knowledge, what does it do? It puffs up, but love builds up. Love edifies. See, we have the knowledge, but we don't have the love. Yes, we can eat whatever we want, but we don't have the love for our younger, more immature um, brothers and sisters. If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And, and what that's saying is that the the younger or the more mature believers they were saying, well, we have the knowledge. We know that we can do this. They had the knowledge, but they didn't have the understanding. Yes, they could eat it and not sin, but what they were doing was causing others to sin because there was no teaching. There was no discipling. There was no walking with them and showing them why this was wrong. They were just glorying in their freedom, and that was the wrong thing to do. Therefore, as to eating the food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. Yes, theologically and spiritually, they're correct. The mature believers know that the idols, it's just a golden pole. It's just a golden statue. Who cares? I can eat this T-bone if I want it. It doesn't matter, right? And that there's no one but God. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or in earth, that word so-called is the word imaginary, um, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God and the Father from whom all things whom exist. Once again, Paul's saying we know that there's only one God. These idols, we, we realize that. We understand this. Verse 7, however, however, with that knowledge, even though we can, however, not all possess this knowledge. Not all believers have this same maturity in spiritual knowledge yet. But some, through former association with idols, we would say new converts, people who worshiped idols, the church has converted, they've heard the message of Jesus, they believe in Jesus, but now they're still di diff kind of working that old life, new life, and, and how, what is good, what is bad. Um, they eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. They're believing it's a sin because that's meat that was offered to, a, uh, to another God besides Yahweh, besides Jesus, right? So they're believing it's a sin. Food, notice this, will not commend us to God. That word commend, this is a big word. Uh, it's the word Peristemi, peristemi, and it means to 
place us near or bring us close, food or drink, um, it will not bring us close to God. So whether whether we can eat meat or whether we can't, we don't move closer to God or farther away from God. Whether we can drink or whether we can't, it doesn't move us closer or uh, or farther away from God, right? It's our faith. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. So it doesn't matter if you eat that meat or if you don't eat that meat. So if it, you're causing your brother to stumble, don't eat the meat. It, it's a simple fact, right? It's, just not, it's not saying don't eat it forever, but maybe you don't eat it at Texas Roadhouse. Maybe you don't eat it at the house with other, when you invite people over for a grill out, right? Um, and so what you're doing, if you're okay with that, it's okay. Your, your conscience has cleared you. It is not against God's law. It's okay for you to do that. But in a public setting or around other people who believe that it is wrong, then you should not do that. Your freedom in Christ does not allow you to walk over other people and other people's beliefs. And that's just the truth. And that's what Paul was doing, right? The older, the more mature should always be looking after and teaching and respecting the less mature. And so as Christians in a church, Paul is writing and is saying the mature should, they're more mature. They should know. They should give up whatever they need to, to look after the spiritually immature until they raise them up and the Holy Spirit changes their hearts and they learn God's word and they're edified and they come to a place where they believe it is okay if they ever come to that place, right? And so the mature should always look after the spiritually immature. And that's what chapter eight's about. I hope that makes sense. Um, remember, he's answering specific questions um, that the Corinthian church had in chapter seven through 10. And this is just one of them. We will see you tomorrow in chapter nine. God bless.